everyone. Um, thanks for coming. I'm Stuart Burnside from the BFI Certification Unit. This yeah. is... I'm Colin Seeley from the same place. Yep. <laughs> so we're here today to talk about video games tax relief and the cultural test that you need to um, pass in order to be able to claim the tax relief. So first of all, can I ask, has anyone actually applied with us before in the audience? Nope. Okay, it's all fresh information. <laughs> no, that's good. Yeah, yeah, good, yeah. There's a lot of information here, so don't worry, we'll be on hand to talk um, after, and you can always get in contact with us um, anytime. So first of all, there's a lot of myths around the certification process and claiming tax relief. We found this when we've come out to speak to um, different developers all around the country. Um, one of the big ones is that video games must not necessarily contain a red phone box, but look British. So a lot of people are worried that their games, I don't know, somehow must be set in London, must have red phone boxes, it must be identifiably British. Um, this is not the case. We'll explain why this is not the case um, as we go through the test in greater detail. Um, another one is that only narrative games can pass the, pass the cultural test. Um, I think this comes around maybe because uh, Creative Europe have a program, and in order to be... Um, uh, to qualify for that, you need to make narrative games, but with um, the cultural test, that's not the case at all. The game can be about anything, and also we have a lot of discussions in the office and with DCMS about what constitutes a game. So, you know, this is a never-ending discussion. Um, there's certain things that you wouldn't think were games, but we would consider them games. So, if you've got something you're not entirely sure of, just get in touch with us. We'd be happy to talk over it. Um, another one is that it's restricted to certain platforms. Um, that's not true. As long as it's available to the public in some form or another, even things like um, we've had games before that have been parts of museum exhibits and things, you know, they've been there for people to play. As long as the public has access to it in some form, um, it counts. It'll be qualifiable for uh, tax relief. Another one is that only big budget games need to apply. Um, that's not the case at all. You know, any budget, there's no restriction on budget either way. So, um, if you're making a game in the UK, you've got no excuse really not to come <laughs> to us. Um, another one is that an accountant must handle the application. Um, we've discovered this when we've been talking to people around the country, um, that this is a common misconception, but it's, it's absolutely straightforward. You can do it yourself. It's just an online form and then sending some documents to us. Some people choose to have an accountant to do it just because it's obviously um, a lot, it might be a lot. It's of, paperwork. Yeah, it's paperwork. A lot of people just don't want to do paperwork. Um, it's entirely up to you. If you want to have an accountant handle it, that's great. Um, if you want to do it yourself, that's, that's also great. Um, next one is the game must have a publisher. Nope. No, no need for that at all. <laughs> um, next, the developer must, be, uh, must own the game's IP. Um, again, that's a common misconception. Um, it, it, that's, that's not necessary at all. Uh, <laughs> one of the biggest ones we see. So there's, there's points that you can get... Um, in the test for British heritage. I'll, I'll go into it a bit more. One of the big ones we get is that people say, oh, well, it's got a Monty Python-esque humor, but this is obviously, I mean, we're looking for, it is a test at the end of the day. We can't kind of just say. I've, I've rediscovered the influence of Monty Python through the course of this <laughs> Yeah, job. I know. Who'd have thought there was so much Monty Python influence? Um, so these are myths, but um, don't worry about those. Um, but yeah, so um, in order to, to qualify for the tax relief, there are a few, um, uh, points that you have to kind of uh, hit on the way in uh, and one of them is that you need to have a development company set up so because it's a tax relief that's paid out um, sort of from the government they can't pay it to individuals they need to pay it to limited companies so you need to have a limited company that's um, registered in the UK registered with Companies House um, I understand that the process is pretty straightforward and pretty simple um, if you're thinking about claiming tax relief or if you have a project in the pipeline it's important to get that uh, company set up even if you don't have all of the details uh, in place yet, but get it set up as early as possible because the only place that, well, one of the main places that people fall down in, in applying for the tax relief is that their company's been set up uh, too late. Um, so you need to get it set up before the move into full production. Uh, that definition is kind of uh, nebulous, but it generally it means when you're moving um, out of prototyping and out of concepting and into what will become the full game, there are no formal restrictions on like what code can carry over and what can't, um, but it's important to get that set up as, uh, as early as possible. Um, the other restrictions are, um, there's a concept within, just within the sort of cultural test tax relief scheme called core expenditure. Core expenditure generally refers to um, 
expenditure that's incurred directly on the development of the game. So not ancillary surrounding costs like uh, marketing or legal, um, but uh, sort of studio rent is and uh, sort of software licenses are, and then of course directly the salaries on development are as well. Um, and then uh, Stuart already talked about it being intended for supply, that's that it's available to the public. Generally the only thing that rules out is kind of experiences that are only provided at kind of expensive team building weekends for, uh, for companies. Generally, if the only place you can access it is through another company that's providing the experience, that uh, game won't be eligible for tax relief. But um, apart from that, it's, it's, it's pretty accessible. Um, and then the final requirement is that it's certified as British through the cultural test, which is what we do at the BFI and what uh, the bulk of this test will actually go through. But um, in terms of covering what the, uh, uh, what the bottom line is at the end is uh, really once you, once you go through all of the paperwork and uh, you put your sort of budgets and schedule in, in order and submit to us and exchange a couple of emails and um, generally it takes around um, sort of four to five weeks once you submit with us but on, on your end you know it, it can be a little bit um, a little bit of effort but what you're what you're working towards at the end is that um, you'll get roughly 20 percent of the core expenditure that you incur in the in the UK back um, the way that's the way that's worked out is that um, the rate of relief is 25 percent but um, if more than 80% of your core expenditure is eligible, it is then capped at 80%, which I always just think of as being 20% of what you actually spend on the game. Um, uh, so there's an example there which is super straightforward, which is just if your game has a 100K budget and you succeed in the tax relief, um, if the game is still sort of loss making, so if you're still in development, if you're still spending money on the game, then you can get 20 grand back as a payable tax credit whenever you do your tax returns at the end of the year. And that's sort of really what all the rest of the information is, is pushing you towards. It's, um, it's being able to claim that money uh, you know, to, to fund another month or two of development or or um, you know, to try something slightly um, uh, riskier. And the other thing that's worth pointing out is that um, the tax relief is only paid on expenditure that's actually been incurred by your company during the year. So when you're claiming it directly from the government, it's something that is paid on expenditure that is already incurred. But there are a number of um, finance options that aren't uh, directly related to the BFI or HMRC, but there are um, finance companies that are prepared to loan money against the security of the tax relief that you will claim the year later. So you can go through third parties to use it as upfront funding, but the, the scheme itself is really just intended to be paid on uh, money that's actually been spent. Uh, so this is just a very brief slide uh, going over sort of what we've, uh, what we've done just in 2016, and it compares pretty much the same to 2015. So um, uh, we've issued 364 certificates in the, the calendar year of um, uh, 2016, and that's, that's interim and final. So interim is generally games that are still in development. Final is generally games that have finished and, and, and been released. And uh, yeah, the, 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 the spans are pretty good. And the, uh, from, a, from a lay perspective, the, uh, the, um, the industry seems uh, pretty healthy. And uh, we've, had to, we've had to hire. I mean, I, when I started, I was the only games analyst. And two years later, we now have three games analysts to hire the, um, the volume of uh, applications that are coming through. So it's, it's pretty exciting and, and, and pretty promising. Yeah, so um, in order to claim tax relief, you need to pass the cultural test. Um, it's not as scary as it sounds. Um, so it's a 31-point test, and the pass mark is 16. So um, it's split into four sections, so we'll, we'll go through those sections. So section A is cultural content. Section B is cultural contribution. Section C is cultural hubs. And section D is cultural practitioners. So we'll break these down a little bit just to kind of explain what these are. Next one. OK, so first section A. So the first thing we look at is um, setting, where the game is set. So um, there's four points available in th this section um, if the game is set in the UK or the EEA. So sometimes it's clearly set in the UK or the EEA. You know, there's some games that are set in Italy. There's some games that are set um, in the UK. Um, but then also we would accept fictionalized UK. So that's some fantasy things. Um, are kind of based, um, you know, around the British, Latin, not landmarks, but British kind of um, landscapes and things. You know, we could, we could maybe say, you know, this is obviously inspired by um, a kind of fictionalized version of the UK. Um, so then the other um, way you can get points is undetermined location. So obviously a lot of games are set just in the kind of sci-fi setting or sometimes even just like a, um, a kind of a nondescript kind of jungle or a desert setting. So even for those kind of things, um, there's 
uh, three points available. So even though it's not set in the UK or EEA, you can still get up to three points in that section if we would consider it just an undetermined location. Um, so the next section is all about characters. So again, there's four points available if it's um, UK or EEA citizens. Um, then again, the undetermined location factors into this. Quite often when there's an undetermined location, um, the characters would be considered undetermined, but you will get four points for the undetermined characters. Um, so we consider up to three lead characters. It's, when you apply, it's up to you to really tell us who you think the lead characters are. Um, as Colm said before, there's interim and final certificates available. At interim stage, we'll just be going on things like game design documents, um, concept art, and things like that. When we play the actual game, then we would kind of uh, decide who we think are the actual um, main characters. Um, if there's no meaningful lead character, and um, we look at a full kind of ensemble, so you know, sometimes sports games and other things like that have got, you know, you couldn't just say this one footballer is the main character, you know, when there's hundreds of footballers. Um, Colm's going to talk a little bit more about these kind of cases um, later on. So here are just some examples um, that, that we certified um, in the unit. So Drive Club, um, it had an EA setting and characters. You know, there's Scotland, there's Norway. I can't remember where else there is. That's it, but it got oh. a couple of points. <laughs> All right, well, I got the points for that. <laughs> anyway, um, everybody's Gone to the Rapture is clearly a UK setting. You know, as soon as you play it, even looking at the artwork just based on it, you know, and the characters too. Um, Gears of War, um, undetermined setting, you know, obviously, um, what's the planet called again? Sarah. Oh, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah yeah. um, it's just kind of like a, a fantasy sci-fi planet, so it would have got three points um, for the setting there and four points for the characters being undetermined. Um, and then GTA, obviously, big British success story, but all set in America, so it would be USA setting and characters, so it wouldn't get the points for that. So the points would have to be made up in the, somewhere else in the test. Yep. So story, there's two ways to get points in A3, and um, sometimes people get these a little bit confused. Um, so we look at the story and see if it's a UK or EEA story. Naturally, when it's a UK or EEA setting and characters, then we would immediately consider it a, a UK or EEA story. But there's other cases um, where it might not even be set in the UK or EEA, but we would look at the story um, in the kind of overall game and decide whether, you know, if it's about characters from there, it could be considered their story, even if it's not set there. So um, it's a bit subjective. Um, we, we just have to look at the game and make a decision based on that. The other way, though, to get points um, in this section is even if it's not considered a UK or EEA story, um, you can get points for underlying material. So that's who created it, who came up with the idea. So if it was created by a UK or EEA citizen or resident, you can get up to four points in this section. So there's a couple of ways that we can um, check to see that this is the case. So one is um, underlying material. So we can look at a design document, we can look at a prototype, script, concept, book, film, comic book. You know, sometimes lots of games are based on kind of, um, you know, the, other things like comics or, or books and things, and um, we can check to see who the creator of this was, um, and we can verify the points that way. Um, one thing we can look at is a chain of title. It's not quite as common in the video game industry. It's more a kind of film industry thing. Do you think that's fair to say? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a standard standard document in the film industry, but the, the video game industry doesn't really have it, so we have to explore some alternatives. Yeah, so we have to look at different ways. So there could be an employer contract that has the creator of the game um, on there. Again, it's up to you to tell us who you think um, in the studio is the creator of the game. Um, we can check the employment contract just to see that their name is on it. Um, Designer's agreement, it might have the, the, the name of the game, name of the designer. Um, if we, you don't have anything like that, we have a document, the underlying material declaration document. We have that on our website. So you can just get that filled in and then um, sent to us and that will allow you to get the, the four points in that section. Okay, language. There's a bit of confusion around here, uh, the language thing with games quite often. So, um, it needs to be English or a UK indigenous language, so that's Welsh, uh, Scottish Gaelic, or Irish Gaelic. Um, and then there's, there's some others. There's some others. Yeah, yeah. I think like there's Cornish. Cornish, one, and, and yeah, so uh, there's one quite. Other that I can't remember. There's not often we get games um, <laughs> in those languages. Uh, British Sign Language kinds as well. Oh, yeah, British it? Sign Language. Um, so there's four points available in this section. 
and it's calculated on a percentage basis. Now, a lot of misconception around this is, obviously there's a lot of games where there's no dialogue, no characters say anything. Sometimes there might not even be characters, really. Um, but the dialogue does not have to be spoken either. It can be text on screen. And also, even just tutorials and menus, as long as they were in English, we would consider the language English. And then you would get four points for that. So um, don't worry if your game doesn't really have anyone speaking or anything. As long as you've got some sort of instruction um, or something that's in English, then you would get the four points for that section. Um, and you're not penalized for multiple language options, because obviously we expect that. Um, so we'll require, we would look at the script, we'd look at, again, the game design document, if you have any screenshots, just anything that gives us some idea that there is English content in it, basically. So I'm just gonna jump in here quickly to try to provide a little bit of reassurance, because I understand that that's a lot of information to take in, and um, the way the test is structured, um, particularly the specific language on the test, doesn't sound like it was necessarily by, written by anybody that had played a video game. Um, and part of the reason for that is that it's, um, the, these are all part of a broader scheme that uh, applies to the other creative industries, so film, high-end television, that kind of stuff. And uh, they're all ultimately derived from the film test that was made in um, 2007. And the language hasn't changed all that much because it's, um, it can be easier to get existing language approved rather than rewriting the entire test. Um, but I just wanted to pro provide some reassurance in terms of how we approach um, applications that we get, um, which is that we essentially take as broad a definition as we can for a lot of the terms that are used in the test and for what people um, supply us with. And just to reinforce as well that um, all this information in the test, you're trying to score six 16 out of 31 available points. And once you do that, you can stop working. Um, and you, you can then send us the, the, the application, and if there are any problems, we get back to you about it. But um, you need to get the certificate from us in order to kind of get through the door with HMRC. So that's what all this is building up to. I was just gonna say, yeah, it's, it's a really open process. So like Colm said, there's just three um, video game uh, analysts at the BFI, so just get in touch with us. It, it's not like a, a immediate pass or fail thing. We'll look at your application if there's, you know, if we think, oh no, you're not going to get points in this section, but you could get points in this section, and um, we'll do what we can, you know, to to try and get your game to to the pass point. So yeah, it's we go back and forth with you. So, so yeah, I mean, ev every month or so, we end up with a new question about what is a setting or what is this setting or what is what that is a character. Video game? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, we try to take as, as as understanding approach as possible that fits within the the guidelines of the test. So just to go through a couple of examples quickly, um, uh, they're all case by case. So we do, we don't really have any broad guidance on this. We 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 look at them uh, ourselves and we work with the developers to sort of understand what the game is. Um, one of the one of the questions that we ask in terms of characters is for a video game, the idea of a character is, is, is quite different to what a character is in, in, in traditionally in a film. So we'll ask what the player's principal avatar is, um, and that allows us to kind of, uh, you know, look at different uh, representations of players. And as, as long as it doesn't become very, very abstract, generally we're able to consider essentially whatever object on screen you're controlling as a character. So um, we've had examples where like anthropomorphic or non-anthropomorphic um, uh, characters are. We've had examples where in a lot of racing games we've considered the car to be the primary avatar rather than a kind of faceless helmeted driver and we've assigned nationality on the basis of the base of operations of the manufacturer of the car because again we're looking at the experience of the player playing the game and the, the test isn't intended to rule out games that aren't filmic. Um, uh, although it's not sort of written down on the paper, your experience when you apply to the BFI, I would hope, uh, will be sort of understanding. Um, uh, with, um, with settings, uh, we've looked at the difference between like, um, so abstract puzzle games sort of along the lines of Super Hexagon that don't really have a, a formal setting or, or games that are more along the lines of um, sort of Candy Crush or its derivatives where you have some kind of guide that's taking you through a world of, of, of mark points. And generally, if you have a guide character in a world that you're navigating, we consider, we can consider it to have some sort of setting, but if it's if it's purely abstract, it's once it gets into that um, portion, like word games and stuff like that, it, it just we can't quite fit it into the cultural test. So generally, you'll have to claim points somewhere else. But it's 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 rare that 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 lacking um, the setting or the characters, if you're making the game in the UK, will rule you out of the cultural test. It's the, the test is very passable without setting or character points. Um, and then yeah, I am bred is up here because. Um, uh, it got um, it got British setting yeah, for the, British the, setting. the the kitchens are very British, yeah, and then the British avatar character. is the bread, 
So um, the bread is a, is a British resident, so it's, um, it's British. But we didn't, we didn't take into account the, the shape or makeup of it, so we didn't, we didn't test whether it was rye bread, and we didn't make sure it was Hovis or anything like that. No but, uh, but yeah, it, it ended up with, uh, with, uh, with British nationality. Okay, yep, so B, uh, section B in the test. Um, generally, we look at section B if you're um, just kind of missing the pass mark because it can be very subjective. Um, so there's three sections. So the first section we look at is creativity. So we're looking for um, games that are unique or do something kind of new um, within the industry, within the genre, any way that you think it's doing something kind of unique. Um, we'll look at, um, again, it's up to you to kind of make the argument. You just maybe have to write a paragraph to us why you think this is the case. Um, we'll examine it. And normally we talk these kind of points over yeah, with and the team. Generally, the people on the team are, are enthusiasts, but they're not technicians. So yeah. if, the, <laughs> if the creativity point you're applying for is, is technical in nature, um, yeah. it's really helpful for us if you can supply a lot of surrounding inf information yes. and compare it to what like currently exists in the market and what, in terms of the end user experience you're doing, that's able to sort of push it beyond what exists currently. I mean, we, we, we have the ability to, 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 to consult with people yeah. that, can, that can look more in depth into it, but um, you know, it's, 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 it's quicker if we can, if we yeah. can figure it out ourselves. Yeah, for the technical side of things. So um, yeah, we're looking, so sometimes if it's the first British game that's done something, even if it's kind of been done before, maybe um, by an American company or Japanese company or whatever, um, creativity within genre, sometimes you know, people mash up genre and things. Um, you can consult the guidance notes for this. Um, it, it, it's fairly open, yeah, it's fairly open. The, the, the guidance notes are vague. Yeah, <laughs> the, the guidance notes are vague. So if you consider that there's something creative about the game, let us know and um, we can take a look at it. Decide. So next one is British Heritage. This can be a lot more straightforward. Um, so it looks at something that's significant from um, a British event, a person, a movement. And this doesn't um, need to go back uh, like hundreds of years, it could be something, you know, from British video game uh, heritage, um, anything, pop culture, lots of different things, yeah. Again, it's fairly vague, what do you consider British heritage? Um, so sometimes there's clear things, you know, if there's like landmarks of a game set around, you know, some famous landmark in the UK, easy. Um, so, but it must have a direct connection, so this is where the, um, the kind of Monty Python thing comes in. You can't really say, oh, well, it's got a Monty Python-esque humor, yeah. because... Right. It's not like, if your game explores ideas of like um, AI or computation, it's not enough to point out that like sort of Turing or, 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 or Babbage were involved in the development of those ideas. The game would have to be biographical or, or yeah. feature that information in some way rather than just being der uh, derived from it. Yeah, so um, this game, for example, City Run London, um, it got heritage points because it's set in kind of medieval London, so there were kind of you know clear heritage landmarks there. Okay. Okay, so diversity. This is the last B point that we look at. So um, we look at diversity across all sectors. So BMA, BAME representation, LGBT representation, gender, social, social exclusion, disability. You know, there's lots of ways that you could consider your game um, diverse. You would therefore get diversity points. So um, there's a couple of different ways you can get for on-screen diversity. So, you know, if you maybe have a female lead character, we would look at that and consider that in um, the entire industry as a whole. And maybe there's some themes that are explored that um, kind of allude to uh, diversity. Um, it must be pretty complex if you're going to look at kind of themes. It's not enough just to... I mean, yeah. what that's trying to say essentially is that um, if you're doing games that have very broadly defined characters and you have diversity within those characters, we would look for them to not be stereotypical portrayals of those. Even yeah. if you're going broad, if your games aren't exploring individual characters that well, you know, you, we don't really want to see stereo... Well, I mean, we don't, we don't care because the game's not... The test isn't quality-based, but if yeah, we're yeah. going to award diversity points, they would need to be non-stereotypical. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we, we look into that. Um, and then also the development team will look at the diversity in the development team, if, if there's um, someone from one of those groups that um, has a, a senior position um, within the team then, and makes a significant contribution, then you could be eligible for points there. Again, all these sections are, are quite subjective, so you just need to make a little kind of paragraph argument to us and we can consider it from there. 
Uh, I'm conscious that we're kind of running short on time, so I'm going to fly through these bits a little bit so that we can maybe take a couple of specific questions if people have questions about their own projects. We're also here for the rest of the day, so we're happy to, to, to chat one-to-one -one afterwards. Um, so uh, the other places, the other two sections are C and D, and you can get points here, and they're a lot more mechanical. They're a lot more straightforward. So section C is essentially, did you spend more than half of the money you spent on... Um, thing X in the UK, and if you did, you can claim points. So um, the, the, the sections of, uh, the areas of work that we, prov that we award points for are, are, are on the screen there. Um, generally, we'll see people largely claim for programming and design, because those are pretty common to, uh, uh, to all video games. Um, and as I said, once, it, once it's over half, the other thing that's worth pointing out when you're filling out the test, if you're confident that one of these fits the bill, it's just awarded for one. There's no need or requirement or benefit to give us all of the detail on all of these things. Just the one that you know has more than half the expenditure there. Um, one thing to point out about these, and it's, it's the place that the, the cultural test can actually cost uh, you a little bit of money. It's, it's never charged directly from the BFI, but when your game is complete, um, these claims need to be verified by an external accountant. Um, if you do end up needing to bring that person in, they only need to verify what's relevant. They don't need to do a full um, accounting. We're just looking at the specific values that you claim for versus the rest of the expenditure on the game. Yeah, that's why we would say if you can pass in sections A and B, um, just to do that, because um, obviously then you won't have the accountant's report and it won't cost you anything to do the test with us. Yeah, the, the only cost, if you, if you can uh, pass on section A and B, the only cost generally is that we require a legal document that um, sort of formally states that the information you've provided is true, and that generally costs sort of five to 20 pounds from a solicitor to get signed, but that's, that's the only overhead you'll actually incur if you, can, if you can pass in those sections. So section D then awards points for uh, the nationality or residence of key people behind the game in the development of the game. So again, these are the, uh, the major areas here. The, um, the definitions here, we take a similar approach to with characters and uh, setting. We want these to be as broadly understood as possible. Composer does specifically end up being music rather than just sound design, but all of the other ones are, are generally quite open. S script writer can generally just refer to someone who has provided language content that ends up on screen. Um, uh, artist, again, can be uh, UI artist as well as character artist or that sort of thing. Um, and then the key staff is listed online when you're on the... Um, uh, the online application form and the development team looks for over 50%. Uh, the main thing here that's um, worth pointing out is that uh, if you're a small team, if you're a one-person team, or if you've only got two or three people, if you're fulfilling uh, multiple of these roles, you can get multiple points. It's not limited to one name gets one point. If, you know, if you're doing the, the design and the art, you can apply for two points there. Um, so just wanted to point out very quickly um, a couple of things specific to VR. So um, the video game test was derived from the film test when a time when VR wasn't really at the, um, uh, you know, right in the zeitgeist of popular culture. Um, so now it's, uh, it is, and there's very little language in the test that actually refers to it. But um, VR has no, uh, you can apply freely for a game that's developed for VR. Um, uh, if you're going to apply under the game test, it needs to have a substantial amount of interactive content, even if that's just the ability for the player to look around a space and then move the, the sort of the player avatar or, or the perspective through a space and explore somewhere else visually. But something, something as limited essentially as a 360 degree camera where all of the action is happening independent of player input, but they can change the view, generally won't qualify as a game for the cultural test. But if you're making VR projects, there are specific um, uh, understandings within the other cultural tests. So generally high-end television, animation, and film that can allow you to qualify under those, um, under those tests, but we uh, encourage you to get in touch with us and talk through those because some of the requirements are a bit um, odd and I don't want to dive into them right here. Uh, the positive of VR though is that because it's so cutting edge, if you make a VR game, generally it's quite straightforward to claim a uh, creativity point in section B. Okay, so how to apply. So um, it's fairly straightforward. There's an online application form. Um, like Colm said before, if you fill in the, the application form and you get to the points that you need to pass the test, you can just stop. You don't need to fill in every single point in the application form. Um, you do the online application form. You need to print it out and take it to a solicitor to get signed, like Colm said, and then you send it to us. The um, test starts from the point we receive the hard copy application. Um, it's four to six weeks turnaround. It depends how many cases we've got going on, which is quite a lot at the minute. Um, so as we said briefly, there's, you can apply for interim and final, and you can claim tax relief with both, both these certificates. As long as you've been spending the money, you can claim. 
And also you can set your own tax year. So um, you need to speak to HMRC because they're the ones who actually issue the tax relief. It's, it's also worth pointing out, if you have a game that sits somewhere between in development and released, um, mm -hmm. so if it's something you're providing a lot of content updates for, if you've released an MVP on mobile and you're doing content updates after that, generally we are happy to assess it either as interim or final, as long as it sort of ticks a couple of boxes, based on what's best for you in terms of the structure of your game and development yep. and how to claim. But again, just get in touch with us so we can get into the detail of it. Yep, so um, the interim certificate lasts for three years, so if you want to get in touch with us early, even just when you just start making your game, we could do that. Um, everyone needs to get a final certificate, so even if you have an interim at some point, you'll have to get a final um, in future. Um, there's guidance notes online, but get in touch with us um, at any time um, if you want some more, uh, if you want to talk through it. Um, so the last thing, after you've done the online application, send us the hard copy. We'll need to see some supporting documents. Um, these are slightly different for interim and final. Um, for interim, we'll need to see a budget. Um, for final, we'll need to see a final cost report. So we just need to see what you plan to spend on the game or what you have spent on the game. Um, schedule, just so we can get an idea of um, the production um, overview. Um, if the game's complete, we'll need a copy of the game because we need to play it. Um, if the game's not complete, then we'll need to see um, whatever you've got at hand. So game design document, maybe some visuals, some concept art, script, just so we can get an idea. So obviously we need to award points characters. If it's, if it's most straightforward to send us a playable build, just send yeah, us a playable build. Do you don't need to make up documentation uh, yeah, in yeah. order to apply for the test. Just whatever you've got, um, we'll look at basically. Um, like we said before, the chain of title or underlying material declaration, you might not need that, but if you do need that, um, you can send that to us. Accountant support, again, accountant support is only required for final certification. Um, and if you need to get points in section C and D, then we'll need that in the hard copy. But um, like we said before, if, if anything's missing, it's not a case that you just fail. We'll just get in touch and say, well, we need this document or we need this document before we can issue the certificate. Um, send everything to us by post, um, the statutory declaration and the hard copy application, and we'll take it from there. I don't know if we have time for any questions. Uh, <laughs> if the, the, is the next speaker here yet? Um, but yeah. Okay. I'll run down. Hello. So thank you very much for your very comprehensive explanation of all the criteria. Um, I'm the Spanish guy in the room, so of course I'm going to ask about Brexit. Uh, right now we have a proto studio. We are not settled as a proper company yet. So it's, uh, it's three partners. Two of us are Spanish, residing in the UK. The third one is British. Um, well, I guess probably you don't know, but how much of this actually changes or does not apply um, because of Brexit? I mean, the, 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 the current guidance that we have, and I mean, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're at the sort of the, the very end of it. We handle the applications. The people who make the decisions are a lot of uh, stages removed from us, um, is that it's going to continue as normal. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's the, the line we've been given is business as usual. Um, so uh, if there's, um, I mean, I, I would say go ahead and apply without, uh, without any fear of it suddenly shifting. I mean, not that it's exactly under my control, of course, but would you advise very strongly that I finish my game within the next two years. We, we, we really don't have guidance to, to give on that. I mean, I, I mean, generally, game development that goes over um, three years is often troubled. So uh, releasing, developing it in under three years is often a good, uh, is often a good milestone to go for. Um, but uh, in terms of how the cultural test is going to change, we, we have been told not to expect it, that, it, that it won't, but we, we don't know. I mean, six months if I have my way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, anything else? No. Okay, cool. Thanks very much. I was just going to say, um, if you want to tweet us at all, oh, it's gone. It's disappeared. Well, come, <laughs> come speak to us after. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. Yeah, these are our two uh, certification tweet Twitter accounts. Obviously, it's not Colm and I. It's um, the head of certification and our um, other certification analyst, Julia. So feel free to get in touch or. Um, yeah, and if you, if, you want the, if you want the slide deck, send us an email and we can yeah, provide yeah, that. That's yeah. not a problem. And, and we'll be around, so come and talk to us. So. All right, cheers. Thank Thanks you. Very much, Thanks so much. Thanks.